Welcome back. Now let's bring you updates from the Russian invasion of Ukraine now. Five people, including a two-year-old child, have been killed in a gas explosion in the housing block in the city of Novosibirsk in Serbia, in Siberia. Video published by Russian Emergencies Ministry shows a section of a multi-story residential building largely destroyed with the building's facade missing. Regional authorities say 11 people had been hurt in that explosion and some 50 residents evacuated. Russia's investigative committee, which is responsible for major crimes, says that it had opened an investigation into the cause of that blast. The Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov says that it would be Ukrainians who suffered if Britain or other Western countries supplied fighter jets to Kiev, adding that Russia would press on what it calls its special military operation in Ukraine until Moscow has set, met its objectives. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, during his visit to London, called on Britain to send advanced fighter jets to Kiev as part of the next stage of Western arms supply to help Ukrainian forces. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says that any delivery of advanced NATO standard fighter jets will only bring pain and suffering to Ukrainians and criticized NATO countries taking a more direct role in the conflict. French President Emmanuel Macron welcomed Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the LC Presidential Palace in Paris for a meeting to discuss the situation and the wartime needs of Ukraine. Mr. Zelensky's rare visit, only his second trip abroad since the onset of Russia's invasion on Ukraine on February the 24th last year, comes after the president's visit to London to meet with British Prime Minister earlier on Wednesday. Meanwhile, President Emmanuel Macron bestowed France's a Legion of Honor on Ukraine's leader, Volodymyr Zelensky. The palace said the, an overnight statement that it is the highest award on a French president can give to a counterpart. Mr. Macron wrote on social media, quote, a salute to Ukraine and its people. A salute to you, dear Volodymyr, for your courage and commitment. Mr. Zelensky told Mr. Macron that Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz late on Wednesday that they had the opportunity to be game changers in the war against Russia, but not hesitating in delivering heavy weapons and modern fighter jets to Ukraine. A video posted by the LSE shows that Mr. Macron handing the medal to Mr. Zelensky dressed in a trademark khaki attire in an opulent room inside the presidential palace. The two men shared a warm embrace and then they held hands as Mr. Zelensky responded to Mr. Macron. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky departed from France to attend an EU summit in Brussels after what we just saw now. He isn't backing down. He's pushing for more weapons at the European Leaders' Summit in the fight against Russia and a quick start to EU membership talks for his country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky arrives at the European Parliament in Brussels together with French President Emmanuel Macron. Both were greeted by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, and Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Carreau as they embark their plane. Ukrainian presidents pose with leaders of the European Union for a family photo on the sidelines of a summit in Brussels. The President of Ukraine, His Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky. Zelensky is greeted by the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, as she introduces him ahead of his address. Zelensky receives a standing ovation as he walks into the chamber of the European Parliament. We know the sacrifice that your people have endured for Europe, and we must honor it not only with words, but with action, with the political will to ensure easier trade and with the fastest possible accession process, with funds for your people, with help 
in reconstruction with training for your troops. With military equipment and defense systems, you need to win. And now, states must consider quickly as a next step providing long-range systems and the jets that you need to protect the liberty too many have taken for granted. We have your back. We were with you then. We are with you now. We will be with you for as long as it takes. Freedom will prevail. Peace will reign. You will win. Slava Ukraini. In his speech to the European Parliament, Ukrainian leader believes his country would join the European Union after emerging victorious from its war with Russia. Ukraine became a candidate to join the EU last June, but the process of joining the 27-nation bloc takes several years. For the first time in its history, the European Union provides military aid of such scale. And for the first time in history, it is working on, I believe, positive evaluation of internal reforms in the European country, which is defending itself in this total war. And while we are fighting, we are also upgrading its institutions. We are moving closer to the European Union. Ukraine that is winning will be a member of the European Union that is winning. Zelensky also thanks Ukraine's allies for the military and humanitarian aid they have provided since Russia's invasion in February last year which has included air strikes on the country's critical infrastructure. I thank everyone who helps Ukraine with the essentials, weapons and ammunition, energy equipment and fuel, thousands of things without which we couldn't make it amid total war. I thank you, dear lawmakers, and you personally, Roberta, that you always defend Ukraine in the European way of life. Europe will always remain free until we are together. Take care of the European way of life. I thank all of you. I invite all of you to Ukraine. Glory to all Ukrainian men and women who are fighting. Glory to Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky meets with the European Union leaders in Brussels after delivering a speech to the European Parliament. While some EU member countries are keen to give Ukraine the morale boost that would come with starting talks to join the bloc, others are much more cautious. Let's now bring in an expert on international relations theory, Dr. Dapo Thomas, who joins us virtually from the Lagos State University, Lasso. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for joining us yeah, on the thank program. You. The Ukrainian thank president, you. thank you. The Ukrainian president had a meeting with the EU leaders following his visit to the UK. He's also asking for fighter jets. Could this help change the war in Ukraine's favor? I mean, knowing that Russia could also be planning its own surprises. Well, in uh, when you are involved in any war of or warfare, you you are expected to have everything that you can muster in for me for the war. So there is nothing that is so spectacular about his request for fighter jets, whether it's F-16 or F-22. Um, the fact is, he's fighting a war. So whatever assistance or whatever thing it needs ought to be provided if we agree that this is a proxy war on behalf of free nations. I mean, nations that believe in democracy. And I want to believe that for the, for NATO and for the West, for the Western allies and the US to have started this, I mean, to have started giving support to Ukraine right from the, the first time it happened. I mean, that right from the first day it happened. It shows that they have recognized the fact that this war is for democracy and, um, since they have now shown that they want to support him or they want to support a free, to, a free society. So anything that he needs to win the war, they are supposed to supply to they are supposed to give to him. He, well, he's begging, and I believe he should not even be begging for it because this is a war that should have involved about 20 something other nations, but only Ukraine is fighting it. And uh, they need every military equipment, any kind of thing they can use in war. So that's one. Whether it's going to change the 
um, course of the war, whether it's going to be a game changer. Uh, you know, nobody can predict the outcome of any war. It's not possible, you know, because I'm so sure that Russia itself never expected that this war would be, uh, will take this long. It's almost one year now. By February 24, it's going to be one year. So they never expected it. So the outcome of any war is unpredictable. Uh, so I don't know whether it can change any game. But one thing that is clear is that the Ukrainians are very good when it comes to um, air, I mean, air warfare, when it comes to air force. They have a very solid air uh, men, you know, that can actually man any kind of fighter jets or whatever. And, you know, they can perform wonders with them, with those fighter jets. So whether it's going to change the whole game, because... Not, like you said, nobody can predict what Russia, what Russia mm -hmm. can do. But I know that there is nothing that Russia has now that is conventional, that it has not been used, that has not been used during this war. The only thing that they have not used is, are the conventional uh, uh, missiles. You know, that we are talking of uh, nuclear. So, but for any other thing they have used, they have used fighter jets, they have used everything. They are using long-range long, long range, uh, artillery. They are using everything they, they have. So that's what he's saying, that give me everything that I also need to fight Russia, and uh, you will never regret that you have uh, supported me. Okay, so Dr. Thomas, that's, you, that's, the, that's my position. All right. You talked about uh, Ukraine should have won this war long ago. Now, what should countries that have already made great military contributions to Ukraine's defense due to help Ukraine win this war, but also remain alert for possible Russian flare-up. Mm, that's what I'm saying. That the only thing that the only thing that I that can change this game for Russia, because now Russia itself is not sure. I mean, I was just uh, I just read we are we have about that they have lost about 1,000 tanks since the war started. That's not that's not a small. Uh, fit for Ukraine to achieve. And that's a very, very serious, a colossal loss for Russia when it comes to artillery uh, losses or whatever we want to call it. So now I'm saying that Russia, the only thing that is unpredictable about Russia, the only thing that would be unusual that Russia can do now is to use uh, nuclear weapons. But for any other thing, there is nothing they want to use that they have not used. They have used the ship. they have used their warships, they have used their uh, tanks, they have used long artillery, long range artillery, they have used air, yeah, I mean they are they are their fighter jets, they have used everything. So the only thing that can make Russia to that can create the unusual about this war on the from the from Russia's end is the use of nuclear. So mm -hmm. all these things are expected. I mean the conventional warfare and everything, Ukraine is up to it. And then Ukraine knows that the West, that is led by the United States now, is very strong on ground to, I mean, watching Russia to ensure that Russia does not use the nuclear. And I'm so sure that because Russia also knows that the, the West is watching, I mean, US is watching and everybody is watching whether it's going to use the nuclear, because the moment that he uses the nuclear, then there is a problem. So do you think, now that we know that Ukraine and Russia are almost a par in terms of weapon usage, would tactics or even weapons win this war? Tactics? <laughs> well, if, you, if you are talking about tactics, I want to believe that the Ukrainians, they have, you know, they have a kind, I mean, they have uh, an advantage, they have an edge over Russia when it comes to tactics. The, the Russians... From history, the Russians don't know how to fight war. They only believe in numbers. They only believe in brute application of brute uh, 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 of force. They fight war as if it's meant for destruction. You know, they fight war as if it's meant for this. It's not like that. That's why you have people or nations being tried for war crimes. Because even when you are fighting war, you are expected to respect some of those, some of these things, particularly civilian targets, infrastructural or energy. Uh, uh, basis, you know, you are expected to provide to ensure, you know, people respect the POWs. Well, they have been doing that. They have been exchanged POWs. But for energy infrastructure, they have been destroying. This is war crime. This is war crime. Killing civilians, attacking residential buildings. This is mm. war crime. You understand? This is war crime. And then you cannot accuse the Ukrainians of anything because, number one, they have not even taken the attack, attack to your own territory. You have said that they should not even venture 
to come and do anything in your territory, which means they are at any at liberty to provide whatever amount of uh, measures they can muster to protect their country. You have come to you are invaded their country, and so they can protect. They have to. They have any rightful right to attack you to do anything for you once you are on their territory, and that's why they go for the civilians. The number of uh, Russian soldiers that have died now, you can't even you don't even want to mention. You know, mm. they have lost men, you know, because they don't even have tactics. They don't even have anything. They, they, over the years, I've been reading, I've been watching their wars. I've been watching the way they fight wars. They, have, they don't even have tactics. They don't have strategy. All they believe is just numbers. And then just to find a way to encircle the, 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 the entire country they have invaded. And then they start uh, mobilizing for attack. And that's why they, everybody can predict them. So everybody knows that they are pre preparing for the offensive, a very massive offensive. Because they, the way they are exactly the entire place of Donetsk, you know, the Donbass. So moving from uh, moving from uh, Bakut now, or Solidad to Bakut. And then so they are predictable. And then don't forget the Ukrainians know their territory more than the Russians. So in terms of tactics, I don't see this war. The only thing that can win this war for Russia, I want to say, is one, two, two ways. Let me say, if they go, if they come for peace, and then they start negotiating. But I don't think the Ukrainians want to negotiate now. They don't want to negotiate now because the Russians have already annexed four of their territories. You have Luhansk, you have Donetsk, you have uh, Zaporozhia, and then you have Asin. So they, are, they cannot negotiate because when they want to negotiate, then that means they are saying, the Russians may say, well, let us give you two, and then you take two. And then no, they don't want to negotiate from the point of weakness. The Ukrainians want to negotiate from the point of zero. In fact, they are even saying that they are going to as far as Recollect, I mean, as far as recapturing uh, um, Crimea, which Russia had already announced in, 20, in 2014. So it's a very long battle we are, we, are, we are going to see. So the only thing that can give, make it, that can change the game for Russia is the use of uh, missile, I mean, is the use of nuclear weapons. All right, Dr. Thomas, let me take you from what you said about Russia not having uh, tactics. The Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said it will be Ukrainians who will suffer if Britain and other Western African supplied fighter jets to Kiev. The spokesman also said, let me read, that any delivery of advanced NATO standard fighter jets will only bring pain and sufferings to Ukrainians. So do you think this is just mere threats? Is he, is he saying, he's not saying anything new. He's not saying anything new because the Ukrainians are already suffering. The Ukrainians are used to it. Those who, want, those who wanted to leave the country have already left. Those who are ready to die for their motherland, they are, they, are, they are in Ukraine. So there is nothing he's saying that will definitely intimidate, I mean, to intimidate the Ukrainians that will drive them away. No, they are on their land. You don't lose your land. You don't do anything. That's one. Then two, if he's saying that uh, I, I, I am also, uh, I'm not going to say that I want to support the supply of uh, fighter jets to Ukraine as such, you know, because it's dangerous. The moment you give them fighter jets, there may be the temptation to go and start attacking Russia in their territory, and that's going to be an escalation, which nobody, which nobody can predict the, its outcome. So I, I personally, that's my own opinion, you know, that's my own opinion, but I just, like I said earlier, that the Ukrainians are at liberty to ask for anything they feel can help mm -hmm. them to change the game, to win the war completely fast, as, as early as possible. But my fear is the same thing that has been expressed by the United States, that the moment they give their fighter jets, it may not just be for only the, I mean, protection or covering, you know, area covering. They, they, there is a temptation to say they want to uh, take some kind of uh, adventure into Russia's territory, and that may be an escalation. And uh, I think that's dangerous. Uh, let's focus on what's happening now. F uh, uh, focus is gradually changing to rescue Turkey following the earthquake. Recovery, reconstruction, all these are still going on. It's still going to go a long way ahead, just as for Ukraine. Can the EU leaders be just as committed to two countries with a huge magnitude of problems and are not even members of the European Union as we speak? I don't see any... I don't think there is any problem there. The, the only thing, I mean, only one country is going through war scenario. The Turkish thing is just a one-off thing. You are talking where you are, you are what you are with, what you are talking now. I mean, if we are talking about Turkey, uh, I know it's not 
yet uh, an EU nation. Uh, but don't forget, its accession application is already being processed. It's just few things that need, I mean, they need to uh, trash, you know, uh, concerning so many things, particularly Sweden and Finland and uh, some other uh, things. Uh, even they, they, they need to discuss some of these, some of the other nations. But mm. the problem is that the EU is not distracted by what is happening in Turkey. What is happening is Turkey just needs humanitarian aid. You know, that's provision of food items and all sorts of things. And that's one of the things. For the clearing of the debris and everything, they, are, they will do that. Once that one is done, that is that is done. It is a natural, it was a natural thing that happened in uh, Turkey. It's not a war thing. So they are not they are not distracted. If it's if, if Turkey is facing another war, and then that means they have to be dividing the uh, military equipment and then the arsenal and everything, the armaments, the weapons, the munitions and everything between these two. That's where you can wow. now uh, that's the, that's where we can now be talking of uh, whether they can cope or they cannot cope. But for now, the distraction is just a matter of uh, one, one month or so. Uh, uh, and then don't forget, there are specialized areas. I mean, there are specialized people, people who are specialists in this area of humanitarian aid. Who will handle that? They are not in Turkey. They are not fighting war. So it's not, I don't see it as any destruction. And don't forget, they will soon become members of you. In any case, everybody knows that you need to train. It's, it's a free nation. It's a democratic nation. It's not an autocratic nation. So they Thank have already you. crossed that side. They are doing the second, which is corruption, to fight against corruption. Uh, so uh, military leaders, those who are involved in corruption, and then they are also trying uh, go putting some of them on trial. So these two nations will still become EU. It does not mean stop them from uh, attending to them. So it's, 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 it's a very, it's a win-win situation for the two nations. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Tap Dapo Thomas, expert on international relations theory. Thank you for your time on the program.